So yeah, so Dustin hired me there, and then he moved to L.A., and uh, I went out to visit Nick. Nick, my old roommate, had moved out to L.A., and I went to visit Nick in late 2011 because I was considering moving to L.A. with Nick. We were really talking about it. We were working it up, so I go out and visit him, and he's living in Hollywood, working at Amoeba Records, so, you know, my first trip to L.A., and I'm, you know, kind of walking around Hollywood and going to Amoeba Records. I remember I bought a Tom Waits album in there, uh, Rain Dogs, which I really listened to a lot and love that album. And um, me and Nick, Nick is DJing in L.A., and his old roommate, Matt, um, and he's DJing out there. So I go to a couple of DJ gigs with them over the weekend uh, just kind of hang out. I remember going to a bar called Rosé, and they had bottles of Rosé all over the wall. All the walls were made up of shelves, and it was just covered with bottles of Rosé. And I was still drinking at the time, so I was just drinking, and Matt was DJing. And I remember I started talking to this guy at the bar, and this guy told me that he had a group of friends that decided one weekend, they just decided one weekend they were all just going to do heroin for the weekend. They were just going to do it for the weekend and then and then not do it anymore. And he said it wrecked most of their lives. <laughs> I mean, that's about the most L.A. thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and by that, I mean just stupid. And uh, I remember that conversation with that guy. Overall, uh, I had a decently fun time in L.A. I went out, I did a uh, gig in North Hollywood. I did comedy. And I remember posting that on YouTube for a while. I was really fat. Uh, my, uh, I was so puffy. My, uh, I had no beard. I don't know if I had a beard or not. But I was, my hair was slicked back. And I just was really overweight. Now this, this trip was rock bottom because by this point I quit drinking for a month and then went to LA and had no intentions of drinking, but almost right away in LA, I started drinking again. So I was like on the cusp of like quitting drinking. I was pretty rock bottom. I remember doing comedy, uh, in LA and North Hollywood. And that ended up being a pretty good show. I got set up with some other people to put me on that show and then one night we found ourselves in a bar that, were, that was doing an open mic. And uh, I asked the guy, can I go up? And he goes, uh, he goes, oh, no, it's already full. And I, I said something. I was drunk and I had some attitude. And he's like, you think you could do better than this guy? And I was like, well, yeah, I think I could do better than this guy. And he was like, you don't just come out to L.A. like this with this kind of attitude, thinking you're better than people or whatever. And I just remember that argument with him. And I was like, okay. But, but and he didn't let me go up. <laughs> but yeah he's right no he is right yeah. i didn't say he was wrong but yeah, yeah i mean i was i was just drunk and yeah know. but i was better than that guy though I would've, yeah i would have did great i don't doubt it i yeah. don't doubt it yeah but through that guy yeah did you feel seduced by la that first trip a little bit yeah uh, a little bit, but also, yeah, because my friend uh, Sam Yakel was also out there at the same time as me. We didn't plan the trip together, but he was out there together. And I remember I went to see some improv shows. I couldn't tell you what they were, but they were in Hollywood. And the one that I saw, it was four people. They did, they basically each played two characters, and it was an hour show, and it was amazing. I was like, wow, this is a very entertaining show. And then I went to see Nick's girlfriend do improv, and it was one of the worst improv shows I've ever seen. Um, it was absolutely horrible. Mm, God bless improv. Yeah. Uh, so it's like that's the extremes with improv. I went to see a sketch comedy show at the Groundlings, and it was amazing. And then me and Sam um, went with uh, another girl that we knew from Charleston who was living in L.A. We went to see... I don't. I think it was the founder of the Groundlings and another guy who played guitar, and they just told stories for an hour and sang songs, and it was really great. And he talked about you know Pee Wee Herman being born right here on the stage, and it was all really amazing. It was just such a great trip, despite how just drunk I was and what a mess I was. I mean, me and Sam were doing day drinking at some weird heavy metal bar on the Strip in L.A. 
And I was just like, I was loving it. I mean, I've always been a Charles Bukowski fan. So I just, you know, as a drinker, I just pictured myself as this prolific writer, uh, even though I wasn't even writing a lot, but a prolific writer and thinker, just drinking down on the bar and, and on the strip in LA. In the middle of the daytime, you walk into some dark, dingy, heavy metal bar with punk rocker chicks uh, bartending. And it was just great. So one night, uh, me and Nick go to the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood. And there's a, there's a, um, Hooker? There, no, there's a, uh, out by the pool, uh, the Hotel Roosevelt pool, there is a DJ playing, and Nick knows the DJ. So we're able to get into this, you know, kind of party that we wouldn't have been able to get into otherwise. And he also got Dustin in, just full circle here with Dustin. Uh, so Dustin shows up with someone, and me and Nick and Dustin are all, you know, just partying at the thing. And Dustin goes and buys us like a round of canned Heinekens. So we're drinking. And I thought, well, that was very nice of Dustin to buy us a round. And I think there was four, maybe five of us. So then I go, well, I'll buy the next round. So I go and I buy a round of Heinekens for like five people. And it was like $50 maybe $70. It was some astronomical amount that I was like, oh man, I wish I had not bought a round of drinks. Now I was fine. I was financially, I could handle it, but it was not a comfortable handle. Mm -hmm. I was like, geez, that blows the budget. <laughs> and uh, so I got, I got more time to be out here because mm -hmm. we used to do uh, op open mic at the upper deck, which it would get really wild in there because I was drinking and I wasn't being paid to host the open mic, but they would give me free drinks all night. So I would just tear through it in there. I would do shots in between comics. By the end of that open mic, it was wild sometimes. Now it was a blast. People had a lot of fun. They loved coming to that open mic, but it would be completely out of control. Evan Burke said he came, like Evan's first time doing comedy. Evan was 18, uh, wasn't even allowed to be in the bar, just got in there somehow. He always looked a little older. He got in there. I put him on stage, and then I disappeared. I went outside. I was probably out front smoking. I was back in the back doing a bar. Evan said his very first time on stage, he did 20 minutes because he was <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were a professional partier. Yeah, and it was a lot of fun, uh, but it ran its course. Uh, it did run its course. Uh, but um, so that, that's a lot. I said a lot to just. I like to think about you as that kind of man about town partying and holding it down and being that connector of peoples and, and maybe some lonely and sad and people going through breakups say, you know, I need to, I need to shake this off for the week. I'm going to call Dusty and just lose my soul for a week or two or in, in alcohol. Yeah. I mean, well, that's pretty accurate. That's I a think. good friend. Yeah. I mean, people would, if they wanted to party. Yeah. They, and also like. Because I feel like you would keep things light. Now, maybe you start yelling later on in the night, but I feel like you'd just be the kind of guy that just keeps things fun and light and listening to music and just. You know, just shooting the breeze. Well, that's absolutely right. For the most part, that was the case. I feel like the the stories that get highlighted, the stories that you remember and you talk about are the bad ones where things go awry and you're like yelling at people and you wreck your car or whatever. But yeah, I mean, there were many nights where we're just, I mean, I remember I picked up this guy. Now I knew him from around downtown, but I was I was in traffic one night. I was drunk. And he saw me and he was like, oh, I'm going to this side of town or whatever. And I was like, get in. <laughs> and we're going down King Street in Charleston. And we're I'm listening to Kiss. I was made for loving you, baby. You were made for loving me. And it had a whip sound in it. Whoosh. I was me. And we were just like, -da -da. and it's just like such a jam. And we're just got the windows down, just blaring music, just jamming. That's what I like to do. I love to roll the windows down in the car, smoke cigarettes, be drunk, just driving arm out the window. I remember I picked up these girls one night uh, downtown. I wasn't even, I was just going to my car. I started talking to them and they're like, I was like, you guys need a ride? And they were like, they were all drunk too. And they were like, um, uh, 
you know, they were like, we're going to this hotel or whatever. And I was like, I'll give you a ride. And they got in and they said they were all teachers. And I played the David Lee Roth Van Halen song, uh, hot for the teacher, you know, and that's a real <laughs> jam. We, we played that all the way across, just jamming it. And then I just dropped them off. I mean, I'm just, I love You're the cool guy around town. I used to pick up hitchhikers all the time in, in oh, downtown really? Charlotte, like, like, you know, normal looking people, but yeah, they were, they would just be, um, you know, walking and I'd pick them up. And would you them. feel like you were some kind of kindred spirit to these wild souls? Yeah, usually. Mm -hmm. Would and you pick up a hitchhiker now? Uh, I don't think so. No, I got a family now and I'm not drinking. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was just like... Um, I mean, then more than ever, you were having a good time. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, you know, it's like I, you know, back in the day I worked, you know, especially in the winter time or, you know, because I would be doing when I when I was a, pe a part time pesticide salesman, I would be, um, you know, I would be working during the spring and early summer. That's where I would be working selling pesticides, and then in the winter I would just be waiting tables. Now, um, for a while, I only worked four days a week selling pesticides. I would do about. 25 to 30 hours a week with Stu, my old boss, the old football player boss that I liked. So I would do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday, I would work – Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I would work Spectracide or I would work at Hyman's running food. For a long time, I worked seven days a week. Um, but then I would start – I started waiting tables. So on Friday, we'd get off around 4 and we'd go to happy hour. So we'd hit happy hour. We'd go to a place called the Noisy Oyster. They had the it was on the corner of East Bay and uh, Market Street, and they had the they would have the windows up, so it was just open air, and they would have happy hour specials where you could get you know wings. You could get like ten wings for I don't know two bucks, shrimp for two bucks, um, uh, oysters for two bucks. I could be off on these prices, but they were very cheap. And then you would get, so we'd have shrimp cocktail, oysters, hot wings, and then you get these tall Bud Lights. And then we would do, you know, tequila shots. I remember pouring tequila in the oyster shell. No, vodka, pouring vodka in the oyster shell, mixing it up in there with a little cocktail sauce, shooting it off the shell. I mean, and then, you know, we do all that, and then we get in the car and drive home. Now, for a while, I lived downtown in the beginning, so I would just bike at home. And it was always a lot of fun to bike amongst all these tourists just be really drunk trying to bike at home amongst a bunch of tourists out there it was great and then i would go back to the sergeant jasper where i lived and i'd go into the little convenience store attached to the sergeant jasper and i would sit out on the porch and smoke a black and mild and harass other people that stayed there i had a little crew of people uh that stayed there uh that i was friends with one guy um he he had a girlfriend his name was Jonathan. He had a girlfriend at the time, and his girlfriend was okay attractive. But I remember her like, I remember he, her like trying to give me some dating advice one time, and he was like, "She should know because she's a woman." And I was like, "I'm thinking, yeah, but not really the kind of woman I'm looking for." You know what I mean? <laughs> Irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, but they uh, broke up, and then he got real sad. And I remember going up to his apartment one time and he was showing me Radiohead and uh, we sat up there and listened to Radiohead and smoked uh, hand-rolled cigarettes. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, these are beautiful vignettes of Americana. Yeah, and there was a girl that lived in the apartment complex from Boston and I'd never, and now uh, keep in mind, when I'm living at Sergeant Jasper, I'm not long left Alabama. So everything is amazing to me. Well, I'm meeting people from all over the country here. There's a uh, the girl from Boston. The accent was just, it was like, I, I just had never heard anything like that in real life. Uh, there was a guy from South Africa there and he uh, found out I was doing stand-up comedy, and he gave me some Bill Hicks CDs. I had never heard of Bill Hicks, and he turned me on to Bill Hicks. So I was driving around listening to this, learning a lot. Um, and and then Jonathan gave me a bunch of Radiohead CDs. Um, Feeling and, a lot. Yeah, I mean, it was just such a great, like, the store connected to Sergeant Jasper reminded me of the movie Clerks. It was just that kind of vibe in there, that kind of convenience store. 
And it was fun. I used to go there and get black and milds and beer. And we'd just sat out on the little porch out there and just drink. Uh, and I used, I yelled at a bunch of people in there. I mean, I, I remember yelling at a security guard one night, uh, for, um, I don't know what he did, but I, I don't know. It was a mess. And that one security guard became my friend though. And he took me and some other people up on the roof of the, of the Sergeant Jasper, which is about, I don't know, it's about a 12 story building. So going up on the roof was a really big deal. Yeah. Especially in Charleston. Cause there's not a lot of high rises. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. And one time me and that security guard were at a party inside, uh, the Sergeant Jasper and he got a call to his work phone and it was a noise complaint about the party that he was at. <laughs> was he on duty? Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's America. He was just partying with us. Um, yeah, one, there was a girl security guard that worked there for a little while, and she came up to my apartment and got high with me one time while she was on duty. That's what I'm saying. You're the guy that people are like, <laughs> we can just kind of slip in and out and be a little shady, but also be mostly fun. Yeah. Yeah, you had a lot of fun there. It was great. Um, actually, one of the guys that used to be a manager at Sergeant Jasper, I just saw. He was a manager at Sergeant Jasper and then later a manager at another apartment complex I lived at in Charleston. He came to my show in Florida not long ago. Yeah, you know, people used to do that to me all the time. I remember there was a guy that I tried to write. This guy asked me, when I still lived in Charleston, he asked me would I help him write jokes. And I said, Sure. And I got together with him. We wrote a bunch of jokes. And then, I don't know, he's bombing with those jokes, but he's bombing with his old jokes too. I, I didn't guarantee him success, but I said I would try to help him. And then I see him on stage one night, and he's like, uh, people are always telling me to write clean. They're always telling me I should be clean. People telling me to be clean. They're not on The Tonight Show, you know. And it's like I feel like that was really a, a swipe at me because I think I'm the only one that was telling him to be clean at that time. And he was like, and he's not on The Tonight Show. So I wonder how that makes him feel now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People were just rude to me for no reason in the comedy scene. If they, they wanted my help and I would try to help them, and then they would resent the help. One time I came down and I visited some relatives in Alabama. And, one of my, and I'd been in Charleston for a few years. And one of my relatives said, she goes, you don't, you don't picked up that Yankee accent. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, I'm in South Carolina, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've had a lot of success uh, with podcast clips talking about Toby Keith on <laughs> on TikTok. I don't know what's happening, but I don't dislike Toby Keith. But somehow, me talking about Toby Keith has really lit a fire in people, and they really. Want, they really like making fun of Toby Keith for some reason, hmm. but it's really gotten me a lot of views. But I hear Toby Keith is very sick. Someone said that, that he maybe has uh, uh, lung cancer or liver cancer or something like that. Goodness. And it's too bad. I didn't look it up, but a lot of people seem to suggest that Toby Keith's not a very nice person in real life, and I don't know. But my mom... Uh, met we saw Toby Keith at uh, Dollywood way back in the day, and my, or maybe Opryland here in Nashville. Um, and my mom went to see, my mom was a member of the Toby Keith fan club, and went to meet him. So we sold out two shows in Corvallis. Uh, those shows were really great. I got some cool pictures with some people, a, a, a group of people all dressed in NASCAR T-shirts and airbrushed hats with their name on it. And they brought me a uh, a shirt, a Dick Trickle racing shirt, which I'm a big fan of. I never, I wasn't a huge fan of Dick Trickle. I don't really know anything about him. I remember him, but the name is the funniest name I've ever heard. It sure is. I mean, Dick Trickle. I used to do a few Dick Trickle jokes. You hear that name and you want to know more. Yeah. And uh, so those shows in Corvallis were really great. I mean, I, I loved 